Hi, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of the Tortoise uh, AI Roundtable. And I think this is the first roundtable to be sponsored by our friends at Teneo, and I'm delighted that they're involved, uh, particularly in such a critically important discussion, uh, which is how responsible businesses can ensure they approach AI uh, in the right way. We've been thinking a lot about AI and responsibility at Tortoise uh, in the wake of the publication of our global AI index. And just to flag to everyone, uh, in March next month, we've got a big report coming out uh, into uh, all these issues. So that's, uh, that's one for your diaries. Uh, and Alexandra will let you know a few more details about that uh, going forward. Um, Alexandra Mazavizadeh, who uh, founded uh, this discussion group, uh, is a bit jet lagged today. Uh, because she's just got back from Miami, where she's heard uh, David Solomon, the Goldman CEO at uh, the Pivot Conference. And one of Solomon's uh, key messages uh, to uh, the conference attendees was that AI was central to Goldman's future, and that any bank that didn't embrace AI would uh, fall by the wayside. The same shift is happening outside banking, of course, a survey by PwC where our first guest, Anand, is a partner, found that 72% of all CEOs believe that AI will significantly change the way they do business. And at Rolls-Royce, where Caroline, our second guest, is spearheading their AI adoption, they view their AI transition as, uh, I think the, the quote is a species level evolutionary event, uh, which makes me think of an AI version of Jurassic Park, which is quite cool, but that's by the by. But when that happens, when industries shift in such fundamental ways, it's easy to see why responsibility matters more than ever. Because if AI algorithms are baked in without proper thought as to their effects or whether they align with corporate values, then the long-term consequences of that, not only for consumers, but for the wider society uh, might be extreme. So it seems to me that if you're a responsible company, generally, then you've got a particular responsibility to think about AI responsibly. But how you do that is still a matter of debate. And with all the upcoming legislation, um, it's very much a moving feast. So to try and bring some clarity to this situation, we've got two great guests. Uh, Anand Rao is the global AI lead and innovation lead uh, for PwC. He's got more than three decades uh, of industry and consulting uh, experience. He's the author, I think, of or the co-author of four books, more than 50 papers on computer science and artificial intelligence. Hi, Anand. Thank you for coming. Um, he's also got one of the best views. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see his background, but one of the best views that I've ever seen on a thinking guest. Um, Caroline Gorski is a group director of R2 Data Labs, formed in 2017 uh, as an accelerator for Rolls-Royce data innovation, uh, and is also, I think, the originator of that uh, species level event uh, quote. So we'll ask her a little bit about what that means later on. Um, before we get into questions, though, like any tortoise AI roundtable, we want to feel like this is a, is a really kind of collaborative discussion. Um, particularly because we know that we've got some real experts listening to this session. And Alexandra and I and Anand and Caroline would love uh, to, to hear from you. So if you have any points of view, please, can you type them into the chat and we'll try and bring you into the conversation. Hopefully by the end of the hour, we'll have a kind of more sophisticated understanding uh, of uh, quite a kind of knotty uh, issue. But wh why don't we start with um, Anand? Um, I, I would be interested in kind of starting off this discussion by talking about what you think is AI responsibility. Is it the, is it the application of long established, previously established corporate principles like trust to AI algorithms and processes? Or is it something kind of more new and more distinct? Yeah, good question, uh, Alexi. So when, when we think of uh, uh, AI and responsible AI. So this is something that I ask everyone. If you're not doing responsible AI, do you mean to say that you are irresponsibly doing AI, right? So in other words, you need to have responsibility into the way you do AI, uh, period, right? So there is nothing like there is AI and then there is responsible AI on top of it. And some people do AI and some people do responsible AI, which is something in addition. So I don't think there should be anything 
which is different that we do in AI other than being responsible. So again, that's just a matter of semantics, but also very important that there is uh, uh, what that responsible AI then means is understanding not just the opportunities of AI, but understanding the risks of AI and mitigating those right from the, the start, right from the design phase and all the way through how AI gets built and used and monitored and so on, right? The entire life cycle, as we say. So your question also is, is this different to what corporates have typically done? Um, of course, there are a number of things that there are policies that uh, uh, companies have. Uh, there's a notion of trust. There is a legal binding, right? So obviously we have regulations and within which companies operate and companies themselves also have ethical guidelines which go over and beyond the regulatory impact, right? So this, this has been there for, for ages, it's nothing new. But there are some specific things that you need to consider when you're using AI. So why is that? So one of the things is, AI is sort of predominantly at least one type of AI, so machine learning, for example, is uh, very much based on data. So just as you use the data, um, and if the data is in some sense biased or not collected appropriately with the right restrictions, then that flows into your models. So you need to be very cognizant of some of those. Um, and again, it's not just the machine learning or the uh, or deep learning aspects of it. If you go broader, uh, AI is also, if you like, uh, encoding, and uh, uh, there's a nice word for it, cognification, uh, by the author of Wired or the founder of Wired uh, magazine. He calls it, calls it cognification, which is essentially taking the uh, what human beings do our expertise and putting that into a software system again we need to be careful as to who those experts are and in what are the experts and is it just one expert multiple experts so in both of those we need to be careful as to how that ai is being used and in that sense it is uh, more nuanced than the traditional way of acting responsibly with trust, with ethics, and so on. And again, we have a framework of looking at uh, uh, bias uh, and fairness, explanations and interpretation, privacy, security, robustness, deep fakes, and, and so on, right? So there are a number of aspects to it, which are very specific to AI, but you can still do that within a broader uh, uh, business environment. So let me stop there. And uh, no, that's a, that, that's that's a really great way of setting out some of the some of the framework that we're we're talking about. I, I mean, if we just pick up on a couple of the points um, that that you mentioned, you, it, is it the case then that to be a responsible AI company, you really need to start thinking about responsibility at an early stage? And I imagine that PwC works with some companies that haven't done that for one reason or another and and how do you get over that hurdle when you work with a company where the data is effectively the framework is effectively already in, already in place yeah a no, good question so again i don't think you need to do anything any drastic reorganization of what where you are and how you are structured again uh, companies are structured in, in quite a number of different ways. So centralized, federated, completely decentralized. So I don't think AI is, is, is should change any of that. But based on how you are structured, uh, again, there are two factors, uh, the, your structure of your organization, but also how much of AI are you really using, right? So it need not be a huge exercise if you're not using AI, of course, progressively more and more companies will start using AI based on the amount or, or the, the type of AI you are using and, and how many of your applications have AI embedded in them. You may want to start with very much the policy side, right? So what is our stand with respect to AI? How are we adopting the ethical principles? So EU, OECD, number of other organizations, IEEE, have come up with various guidelines and I think a reasonable amount of consensus. So we'll never uh, ever agree on the exact wording of everything, right? So, but there's a reasonable level of consensus on those ethical principles. So start from there and start 
looking at the policies that impact the people, your the way your IT systems are uh, structured, the way you are uh, using your various processes within the organization. So that starts at that level and also purchasing, right? So what kinds of uh, tools you're procuring. So the AI, it's not just the AI that you develop, it's also the AI that you are buying from others need to be used in a responsible manner. So it's very much around that policy side. And then we get into the business side. What kind of problems are you addressing? Again, the problems uh, need to be approached from the problem side, not from the AI side. So you don't need to have an AI project. There shouldn't be any AI project. There should be a project to increase uh, customer experience or make customer experience better, increase acquisition, increase retention, whatever the business metric is, AI can be useful there. It's not just AI, there could be other traditional methods. So one of the fundamental things that we talk to our clients is, hey, don't go with the AI mindset, go with the business mindset and then look at how AI could potentially help. There could be other technologies that help as well. And you don't have to always go towards the, the most uh, sophisticated, complex, quote unquote, cool technology. In some cases, very simple technologies will be fine, right? So be more judicious in how you select. But if you still need to go with AI and, and use some of those advanced techniques, then you go into the data science software world, right? So that's how the models are built, how the models are deployed. And now there's more attention in how those models are updated. So we are getting into the uh, region now of AI being continuously learning, right? So embedded lifelong learning. So it just means that you can't treat it like any other software system where you have installed it. And um, as long as the, the software is running, um, uh, everyone is happy, you, you can run it, you can let it run because in AI, the, the, the data changes every, every day, every month, every quarter, uh, and customer behavior changes. So the performance of the AI changes. So you need to keep monitoring that and retire and update it. So it's the entire life cycle. Then of course you have the compliance, governance, risk management aspects of it. So we look at it sort of very holistically uh, across the entire life chain as to how you act responsibly. Again, I want to emphasize that Although you look holistically, you don't need new institutions, new organizations. You want to wind into what organizations already have, various governance committees, steering committees, uh, various ways of looking and escalating risks. So doing a risk management on what you are doing. So again, wind it into your existing structure. Thank you so much. Well, I want to turn to, to, to Caroline now, but I, after we speak to, to her, I, I'd really like to bring in Anushka Sharma and uh, Miranda Sharp uh, from the chat, both of whom are making really interesting points uh, in the chat. Um, Caroline, I might actually start off by asking you a question that Miranda posed in the chat, which is, is there a difference, do you think, between a responsible AI company and a responsible company? The only difference really is how much any organization is using AI. I mean, right. if you're not using any at all, and I imagine that's almost impossible in this day and age, then clearly you could be a responsible company with no AI being employed without being a responsible AI company. But but other than that, no, I, I, th I agree very much with Anand's point that that as you as, as any organization thinks about its place in the world and how it behaves in a way which complies with its its ethical position and the regulation if it's governed by regulation that it's governed by um, then understanding how new tools to unlock business value and ai is just a tool to help support unlock un, un, and unlock business value thinking about how you deploy those tools in a way which is responsible is part of your general um the things you should be thinking about in fact when we started, I mean, Rolls-Royce has been working on advanced data analytics in engine health monitoring in predictive maintenance um, for more than 30 years. And we have been deploying artificial intelligence models into that work for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we're now on our second or third um, uh, AI model or set of models. Um, and, and those are, um, those are self-learning models. So, so for us thinking about how we deploy AI as with any other tool in a way which is compliant with our safety ethics, is compliant with our, our understanding of trustworthiness, uh, our understanding of product integrity, and our understanding of our 
our position ethically in the world is, is kind of a is a very natural part of all of those processes. It's not a set of standalone activities that we only think about when we kind of open a box that's labeled AI. Can, can I just can I just drill in on that? Uh, mainly because I'm kind of obviously not an expert in the specific processes that that you work with on a day to day uh, basis. But I am interested in whether you can kind of give us an example of an, an AI driven or an AI uh, assisted process at Rolls Royce where safety or ethics or trustworthiness is specifically thought about and where if that that wasn't thought about an, a different outcome would be uh, you would see a different outcome emerging yeah so I, I want to start this I guess by by just broadening out our context of thinking about what trustworthy AIs means a little bit beyond the kind of common conversation and debate that happens much of the debate that happens around um AI trustworthiness or, or responsible AI is focused on ultimately on questions of fairness. And that's a really, really important question to be thinking about. And those questions of fairness think about, you know, is my data biased? Is my model suffering from, from bias in its, its encoding and its training? Is my model suffering from some kind of algorithmic drift in its processes? You know, am I reinforcing existing cultural biases uh, in, in a, you know, unfair biases that, that existed previously and I'm now uh, pushing those into a machine um, learning uh, approach at massive scale. Those are really important questions, but they're not the only important questions. When you work in an industry where if you're deploying AIs into the monitoring of complex machinery across its life cycle, which might be 25 years, it might be 75 years in the case of, of some of our defense products, then actually the question you need to ask yourself is, do the decisions that these AIs are recommending, even when you have humans in the loop, ultimately, to make sure that, that they are regulatory, are compliant with our regulatory environment, are these decisions actually safe? You know, are they, you know, not simply are they compromising fairness, are they compromising safety? Um, and that's critically important. And I think that Wait, lends safety has defined how? Safety has defined in complex machinery failing and people being killed. Right. Product safety at that level of seriousness. It's the same challenge that's faced, interestingly, by the autonomous vehicles sector. So it's exactly the same challenge that is being addressed by you know, all of the companies involved in developing the navigation and guidance systems and driver response systems in the autonomous vehicle space, whether you're talking about autonomous cars or autonomous ships um, or autonomous aircraft. Um, but it's a different lens on this question to a lens which is predominantly interested in you know, is my personal data safe? Am I being treated fairly when I apply for, for credit scoring, for example? The question of when I'm using an AI to say, you should take this engine off the wing and bring it in for a review to see if it's actually functioning the way it should function, that recommendation by an AI, you know, has a direct potential into the, the safety of a product, a complex mechanical product that exists in the real world and that people's uh, own personal individual safety relies on. And, and how do you, if you sort of go one step forward from that, how, how do you, you and your team think about uh, making sure that, that AI technology can uh, increase the safety of the products that, that Rolls-Royce produces? Yeah, so back at the end of 2020, and this was after about two or three years of, of research and, and peer review, we published um, uh, on uh, under Creative Commons what we call the Aletheia framework, which is um, is a a checklist. It is it is the way you go from the the what of AI ethical and trustworthiness principles to the how of actually deploying them in operation. Um, we're very lucky, I think, in the space that we occupy in the industrial um, application space for artificial intelligence, because we are always thinking about product safety, because we live in that world. We're very used to um, considering safety and quality assurance at every point of product development. And that's true as true for digital products as it is for physical products. And as a result, we already had um, what we call a digital passport internally to Rolls-Royce, which is 
our QA, our agile QA process for assuring that digital products that we're developing are, you know, can be can be trusted and have the right level of product safety attached to them, just in the same way as we would for any physical product that we manufacture. And and Aletheia um, was was built to to form an integral part of that digital passporting system. So it, it essentially takes 32 ethical principles, many of which most of you would recognize from you know, all of the extremely good work that's gone on it, theoretically and in, in the kind of connection between philosophy and ethics around artificial intelligence. It takes 32 ethics and it asks specific realization questions. How are you going to make that ethic show up in the actual AI development work that you're doing? And then it asks you to provide evidence. Where is the evidence you can point to that you have actually implemented the realization principle that, uh, that ensures that that ethic is being complied with? And that framework, which um, we released a, a second variant of this December with a, with a, a new, um, element looking particularly at data bias and again having this very very practical approach that says how do you what what are, the, what are the questions you should be asking yourself in order to control for or mitigate against unwanted bias because some bias by the way is wanted because if you need to oversample in order to be able to pick up a faint signal then you actually want to be able to introduce bias to your data set, but how do you control for and mitigate unwanted bias in your data set? So that's now formed part of the of, of Aletheia as well. From our perspective, th that simply is the way we live and breathe inside our organization. Um, you know, we, we, we take a safety first approach to pretty much everything we do. Um, and that stands for digital activity and data analytics and AI activity in exactly the same way as it would stand for, you know, making a new component out of ceramic or titanium. Well, well, as, as expected, we're getting some some really really amazing comments coming through in the in the chat. And I, I'd like to turn to a few of them now. But Caroline, can I just ask you what, one more question around the Aletheia uh, principles? Um, are these 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 were created solely by Rolls-Royce internally by Rolls-Royce, and they serve effectively as a, uh, a kind of self-regulatory set of principles that you abide by. Do you think that that kind of covers you going forward, or how do you think that plays into the standards debate in terms of whether more kind of unilateral standards need to be applied? Yeah, so, so Yes, you're entirely right. Aletheia was, was first developed to meet an internal use case. So we started to look at places where, so much of the experience we've had in deploying artificial intelligences into our processes over the last 10 or 15 years has been in human in the loop processes. So the AI will make a recommendation, but ultimately the decision around whether that recommendation is taken forward is, um, is, is performed by a, a highly skilled um, human being. As we started to explore some areas of AI uh, uh, development into, um, into processes where uh, we were much closer to the safety criticality um, boundary. So where, for example, we were looking at using um, computer vision to do robot inspection of specific um, parts. There, we, we, we understood that we needed to, um, to greatly enhance our approach to uh, being able to demonstrate the trustworthiness of what we were doing. We knew that the results were actually performing at a higher level of accuracy than humans, but we needed to be really, really clear that that was the case and we could show the evidence of that because we work in a highly regulated environment. Um, and that's that, that was the originating use case for getting Aletheia developed. What was fascinating was in the, in the sort of 18 months of peer review, where we took what we built and we showed it to tech companies, we showed it to academics, we showed it to um, lawyers, we showed it to uh, peers from our own industry. It became pretty clear that at that point in time, this very kind of practical approach didn't really exist anywhere else. There was a lot of theoretical principle-led activity, but there wasn't, thing, there wasn't a thing that could be picked up by a manufacturing engineer and understood you know, as part of the process uh, in the way that, that the framework is. And that was the reason that we published it open source. Um, since then, we have discovered that it reads across 
um, which we were genuinely quite surprised by, but it reads across into other sectors. So we've been working in the last 12 months with um, uh, uh, colleagues in um, oncology. We work with a group of oncologists who are um, looking at adopting Aletheia into the processes for assuring artificial intelligence for mapping cancer treatment, radiation-based cancer treatment. We worked with a startup in the music industry who have adopted Aletheia as their way of showing that they're, they're labeling and selection of tracts, tracks for, um, for music streaming services is being done ethically. Um, it's been adopted as the basis of the framework for the UK's AI and education policy. Um, you know, so it's, it's applied into lots of different spaces. I think because it's adaptable and practical and, and is continuously part of a conversation which improves it. So to come to your specific question, no, I don't think this is enough. I think we have to continuously improve our thinking and our understanding. That's part of the reason why the second version included a, a data bias um, management tool. But it's also something that we take into conversations with our regulator, um, uh, multiple regulators. Uh, and, the, and Aletheia, along with um, our quality assurance um, approach to artificial intelligence has meant that we've had very productive conversations with several of our regulators in the aviation industry who themselves are interested in how do they draft the regulation they're going to need to apply to us and our, um, uh, our competitors in, in regards to how we think about more widespread deployment of AI in these kinds of safety critical processes. Thank you so much. It's absolutely fascinating. Okay, let's turn to Anushka Sharma, if she's around. Anushka. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank, thank you so much, Caroline. I feel like you've answered already so much of what I was initially talking about, because on the consumer's perspective is very different to the safety perspective when it comes to the machines at Rolls-Royce. But I think one of the things that I'm seeing sort of in the high performance computing side of things and the application of AI now is the use of synthetic data informing surrogate models. Now, obviously, Wait, this uh, is can you just explain that for for so, in the so high performance computing is what we might consider to be supercomputing. So using um, GPUs, uh, graphical processors or CPUs, which is called sort of more the traditional ways in parallel computing to basically help with simulations for, uh, in my environment, it's helping astrophysicists simulate um, uh, gravity, uh, it, the formation of galaxies and other such uh, data. That's but, so cool. <laughs> what, what, it's great. It's a national facility for the UK called Dirac. It's it's wonderful. And what's so cool is we're now looking at the, you know, in industry, we hear about people talking about creating digital twins. But in the academic environment, we talk about surrogate models. And that's because they're based on um, formulas and like the physics and the maths behind um, simulating a portion of data. Now, when there are gaps in these models, that's where we tend to talk about using and applying synthetic models, which I believe in other industry and sectors, they do also do, and they can buy in data. I guess on the academic perspective, as um, Caroline explained, we always have to talk about the evidence and how and why we were able to fulfill a portion of data for a model. But I wonder how that is a, of course, with the frameworks we're discussing, how can industry be aware of using synthetic data, buying in portions of data as we move into this like knowledge economy where so much data is being farmed, harvested constantly, but actually having a way to understand that if we do need to go back and um, audit data, that we understood that this specific portion of data that was applied, that was externally sourced, was the reason why X happened i hope that makes sense and and isn't too much of a, a ramble but it's more about just being accountable for the synthetic data uh that might be applied in models going forward thank you so much um and uh, you you have your yellow hand up which is great because i asked you to 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 do that if you if you wanted to come back on a point so i'm going to turn directly to you <laughs> yeah, yeah no um i know that Questions are just to Caroline. I don't know that you want to pick it up, and then I can definitely uh, say what some of the things that we are doing with synthetic data as well. Caroline, do you want to go first? Oh, thank you, Anand. Um, so I'll, I'll yes. Uh, so I completely agree with your point. Um, I, I think one of the um, it, it, it's a it's a real important challenge in the context of the industrial applications of AI because there is a structural challenge which 
you and we, me, all of us here are hugely grateful for, I, I promise you, but there is a structural challenge with well-engineered training data sets um, in, in industrial AI applications. They suffer often from scarcity of uh, critical failure event data. And the reason they suffer from scarcity of critical failure event data is because industrial organizations actually don't end up, you know, they have, they have good safety management processes, which means that critical failure event data, thank goodness, doesn't happen very often. You know, planes don't fall out of the sky very often. Nuclear power stations don't blow up very often. And when they do, uh, you know, oil rigs don't actually get destroyed very often. When, all, when those things do happen, it's, it's catastrophic and awful, but it's genuinely quite rare. And as a result, trying to train an AI to look for the kind of um, preceding indicators and features that would lead to a, a, a catastrophic failure of that kind is really difficult to do because that, that event data is scarce in the data set. And so industrial organizations do have to start thinking about their approach to synthetic data generation or oversampling or other mod modes by which they can they can effectively train their models um, to do the job that they want them to do. Uh, and, and, you know, whilst, uh, you know, not, not um, uh, not over uh, describing it. That, that's that's part of the the why the data bias um, development for Aletheia was so important because be, being able to actually say, I, I not only I, do I understand where my data has come from, whether the collection of it is likely to be subject to bias, whether the labeling of it is likely to be subject to bias, you also need to be able to explain if you're using th synthetic data or if you're using um, data manipulation techniques in order to um, in order to help train the model more effectively, what techniques are you using? Why are you using them? And what's the likely implication of that for the model itself? OK, fantastic. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious that we're more than halfway through and uh... I have about 10 more questions and uh, the people in the chat have uh, significantly more than that. And they're all really good. So I don't know how we're going to get through it, but let's try. Can we bring in Kevin Allison if he's around? Uh, because Kevin is making some great points about AI policy that would be great to hear from him or Mark Etienne, who was, who was talking about standards. If either of those two are around, I would love to hear from them. Yes, Kevin, hi, 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 Alexi, Kevin here. Um, hey. Yes, so I, I think that the policy environment around AI is really interesting right now because we are moving from a period, I'd say over the past roughly five years, in which you've had many companies rolling out ethical frameworks or, or ideas around what principles-based AI should look like. We're now transitioning to a period moving away from that kind of soft uh, principles towards harder coded rules, regulations, and standards. And the, the, the chief uh, the, the sort of biggest highlight of this trend, uh, which many people will probably be familiar with, is the EU AI Act, which was introduced last year and is in the process of sort of going through the, the, the EU uh, legislative sausage making machine. Uh, but also global efforts uh, underway in different standards bodies uh, and, and inside different governments around the world, including in the US through the National Institute for Standards and Technology or NIST. Uh, to really develop concrete standards around some of these issues to try to bring a little bit more uh, of a codification or a consensus on what ethical or, and safe AI look like. And, and who, I want to come to Anand to, to talk about regulation and how particularly US companies are approaching uh, uh, this issue. But, but Kevin, in, in your mind, like who is leading the, the, the standards race in, in, in AI? Is, is Europe with its AI Act taking the lead? Well, I, I do think that in, in one sense, the EU is, is in a way trying to do a GDPR uh, in, in AI regulation in the sense that just like with the GDPR privacy law, uh, which set a de facto global baseline for privacy practices, has been quite influential, uh, at least as a geopolitical instrument, the EU is attempting to do something similar with its AI Act and being a, a first mover and using the, the power of its 500 million person consumer markets and its ability to, to do big ambitious legislation through Brussels to, to really establish a global standard. And the EU AI Act, in my view, is it, it's akin to a product safety and labeling scheme for what the EU considers to be high risk AI applications. Uh, so, so in contrast to the US, for example, which has, has stated multiple times that it doesn't intend to take uh, a, an approach of regulating AI 
as such. It would rather regulate sector-specific uh, or use case specific instances of AI through uh, executive branch or agency rulemaking rather than a, an omnibus piece of legislation. The EU wants to take its, its AI act and establish that as a global standard. I think the trick there is, can it design effective regulation that, that is, is it, where it's possible to implement it efficiently uh, and doesn't overly kind of um, weigh down the, the innovative ecosystem in the EU that's trying to roll out AI applications? Okay, fantastic. Well, your, your, your comments were so apposite that both of our main guests have their hands up. Um, let's turn to Anand uh, first. Anand, it, how are the US companies that you and PwC speak to kind of on a daily basis? How are they thinking about AI regulation, specifically in terms of responsibility? Yeah. So when you look at uh, regulation, I think there is a, there is a spectrum of regulation. Obviously, the the, the, the extreme end is uh, a federal regulation applying every, everywhere, like something like the EU AI Act, which will apply to anyone operating in EU. But that's not the, the ultimate, right? That's one end of it. But if you look at EU, uh, UK, for example, UK has been publishing a lot of guidelines uh, across data, across models, AI. Um, yes, it might go into legislation, but currently it's sort of a lot of guidelines. Then you have US, which again, as uh, uh, the, the, the speaker was saying, uh, it's essentially embedding or, or giving the mandate for the various existing agencies to uh, be tougher on some of those issues. And then if you go further down, uh, there is self-regulation, right? So that's what you are seeing most of the companies uh, as, uh, uh, as Caroline was saying, right? So how they are pulling together uh, principles from what they have seen, something that is applicable to their organization. Almost every financial services, healthcare, high-tech firm is doing that. Um, uh, almost all of the big ones. So when it goes into more of the process industries and so on, depends on the extent they use AI that they'll come to the self-governance. But self-governance is active where people are essentially looking at all the body of work that has been done and then are tailoring it. So obviously there is, there is a difference between uh, all the different companies, what they do, what they think they should be doing and so on. So there is this sort of wide spectrum and in terms of who is leading, I would definitely say EU, OECD, and the European bloc is definitely leading the discussion around this. And, and I think I'm pretty sure will legislate in some form or the other. Now, many of the companies, as we know, are global. So when it becomes global and when they have to uh, uh, get into the EU, obviously most of them do, uh, they start changing or complying with the EU law, which then becomes difficult for them to have two set of standards, one for EU and for non-EU. So then they start adopting more of the EU standards. If it's good for EU, why isn't it good for an American or a Canadian? So they would start doing the same kinds of uh, principles, adopting those. That essentially creates a waterfall that others also start adopting. So that's which one is what thing. happened with the GDPR, if I'm correct. With the GDPR, right? So. And again, just given the US legislative system, uh, there, is a, there is a comprehensive act called Algorithmic uh, Accountability Act, which has been around for almost six years now. So it was there in the previous administration and it's still continuing. Um, again, it's anyone's bet as to whether that will pass or not. But what we also seeing is some of the states uh, which are activist states are adopting variations of the EU to apply in their states. Again, some of them are major states like New York and California, sort of looking at hiring or uh, uh, biometrics uh, uh, regulations. So very specific use case based. They are, they are already doing it, body cam uh, uh, data. So those also would force the discourse around what regulation that, that US should have, right? So it may not be comprehensive, but you'll definitely get, uh, we're already seeing quite a bit of that. And interestingly, over the past, I would say a couple of years, uh, year, year and a half, maybe the high tech industry, which is generally not been 
very, very favorable or not looking at uh, regulations as such, have started implementing more of these policies, principles within and adopting them. Uh, obviously, there's quite a lot of intense scrutiny on what they do, and they pick up many of the things that, that are happening here. Um, uh, thank you. I, I, I want to ask you one quick follow-up question, but I'm also conscious that um, you, you may have wanted to come back on Anushka's point about synthetic data. So do, yeah. do you mind just answering that question and yeah. then move back? Yeah, sure. So, so we take synthetic data. So we have been using synthetic for almost for a for a decade or more. There are two types of synthetic data, right? So one is, uh, as Anushka was saying, uh, now synthetic data within the industrial domain, simulation domain is getting common to generate data so that that generated data can be used for learning. So that generated synthetic data is one aspect of it. Again, you need to have similar control, similar uh, uh, principles applied to synthetic data as you would for real data or external data, right? So that's one type of synthetic data. The other type of synthetic data, which happens more in the non-simulated environment, not digital environment, is people are taking uh, data with PII, uh, personally identifiable information, but then essentially unmasking them, looking at distributions and generating synthetic data on customers, more, more structured data. So again, there we need to be very careful on, is it something where you can reverse identify the PII, right? So, and you need to test those things as well, right? So there are two strands of synthetic data and uh, to your question around, uh, uh, what do we do there? So we do need to have those. So again, um, there are a number of those principles to sort of uh, encoded on the responsible AI toolkit and uh, bias and fairness is one aspect. And as uh, I think Carolyn was saying, the, the safety security is a different aspect. And it's interesting, I think Carolyn was mentioning this, uh, in the heavy manufacturing process industry, safety security takes far higher precedence over bias and fairness. If you look at the information oriented industries, it's more that rather than the safety and security. So having analyzed all of those industries, we can see really see patterns. So it's not really one size fits all. You do need to look at all of the different variables and depending on your company, you may want to focus more on the safety side, uh, less on the bias or vice versa. And, and there are things like explanation and so on that, that are transparency that are common to all of them as well. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I want to, if, if I can, ask a question to, to Caroline, uh, who, which has been posed by someone in the chat called Pearl Lee. So can I ask Anand one more question from me? And then it would be great to get Pearl Lee up on the screen if they were around to ask the question uh, to Caroline themselves, because I think it's a really, really good one. But Anand, let me, let me just bring a, a point to you from uh, Helen Mitchell in the chat, which is, do you think that we will see a new gener genre of hires bloom in the business world, such as, it's quite difficult to say these with a straight face, Hode, head of digital ethics, Chow, chief AI officer, chief, eth chief ethicist, head of corporate morals, and where does this role sit within the organizational structure? What, what are you seeing in that respect? Yeah, um, so I'll say, some of that is already happening, right? So uh, I think one of the companies in the high tech area as a chief AI ethics and humane use officer is the title uh, of this person. So there are organizations which are taking uh, the notion of uh, ethics and uh, AI ethics seriously. Uh, but my own view there is it's not that every time we have something new, uh, we need a chief ex officer. Um, mm. I think uh, ethics and compliance is something that every organization has, right? So uh, uh, ethics and compliance officer, it may be the chief level or it may be under administrative or finance risk organization, depending on the organization. So what I would rather have is not necessarily have for everything there is a chief X, Y, Z, but make sure that there is this ethics and compliance, of course, that's sort of more prominent in, in the regulated industries like financial services and healthcare, the compliance officer is a must, but other industries, tech typically doesn't have those because they have not been as regulated as the others or oil and uh, gas or mining or manufacturing companies. So I think 
they're trying to find either the risk administrative officers to take on this ethics and compliance would be the way I would go rather than just try and invent yet another C-level. Same thing, I don't approve of chief AI officer, distinct from chief analytics officer or chief right. data officer, data analytics, automation, AI all go together. As soon as you uh, have too many chiefs, then uh, I don't think you're going to be functioning very, very well. Uh <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much. Okay, let, let me just um, turn now to Tapoli if, if they are around. Yeah, um, well, thanks everyone uh, for this talk. It's been super interesting. I would just love to hear more about how businesses and well, Rolls Voice in general are thinking about transparency and trust in AI amongst the wider public, particularly when AI is used in the defense industry where information sharing might just be more sensitive given potential security implications. But then at the same time, the pub wider public might also have a vested interest in knowing how their data is used. Are general principles sufficient to inspire trust in AI in those more sensitive industries? And if not, um, what should the approach be? Before, before we ask Caroline that, um, uh, Pali, what, 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 do you, what do you think? How, how do you think we should weigh up those two factors? I think a lot of that will come from regulations um, helping to inspire trust. Um, but I'm not sure about how businesses in the meanwhile should actually approach this whilst those are being ironed out. So yeah, we're keen to hear from the experts. I mean, I think Caroline, you know, that it is such a critical point, isn't it? Rolls-Royce works with some seriously proprietary technologies that they would not want their competitors getting their hands on looking behind. So how do you balance that kind of commercial imperative with the principle that you're gonna be as transparent as possible in opening up your algorithmic decision-making process to scrutiny? Mm. So it's a really good question. And, and um, interestingly, we went around this debate even before we published Aletheia, because when we, when, when we had done the work, given that I talked about the fact that we developed it for an internal use case, right? So we, we developed it for an internal use case. We went out and to, to check whether what we'd built was good enough. And we came back discovering that not only was it at that stage good enough, but that nobody else had one. And so then we got into a conversation where, uh, and there was a genuine debate, which was, do, what do we do with this? Do we keep this to ourselves for some kind of commercial advantage? Do we use it to browbeat our competitors by saying we've got this and the regulators like it and you haven't got it and we won't share it with you and therefore we you know we're going to be able to take a, 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 a an advanced position um and i sat down with um warren our ceo and just said warren i want i you know i would like your support for us to just give this away and he was completely on board with that in fact you know he he from his perspective we had a moral and ethical imperative as rolls royce to give it away but, because but, but Sorry to interrupt. Am I? I mean, we might be talking across purposes because I'm not talking about whether or not you should have, or shouldn't have shared the the Aletheia framework, the principles by which you're going to develop and uh, uh, and expand AI within Rolls Royce. I'm talking about how transparent the algorithms you deploy commercially should or shouldn't be. Yes. Sorry, I, I offered that as an example to, to show that that kind of debate happens frequently in in this context the, the way that the framework works is a, an input output assurance framework so it assures that the inputs that you uh, that you put into your algorithmic development process are trustworthy and that the outputs you derive from your algorithmic process are trustworthy it does not require you to open the black box it doesn't require you to publish every element of what happens in the actual um, in the actual model development itself. So, and it specifically doesn't do that. One, because it's actually profoundly challenging from a technical perspective to break open that black box. There's lots of very good work going on around it, but frankly, from our view, it's, it's probably several years, if not a decade of being applicable um, in a practical sense. And so if you need to have that as part of your compliance, then you're gonna to have to stop until that's ready. Um, but secondly, um, by having an input output assurance model, you don't need to give away that element in the middle, which you might consider to be commercially um, sensitive. And that suggests then that 
compliance with the framework will be much higher because you're not asking commercial organizations to give up the, the piece of the puzzle that they would consider to be their, their own IP. Um, so, sorry, I offered that as an example, just, just to talk through that, that challenge. Um, to, to Pearl's point, though, um, about what's the, how do you need to think about the public's understanding and public trust in AI? That's, that's of course, incredibly important if you're an organisation delivering services directly to the public. But I'd argue it's just as important if you're someone like me in an organisation that delivers B2B service, which, is, which end up with the public. And the reason it's incredibly important to me is because the biggest interface I have or my company has with members of the public is our own employees who are all themselves members of the public. One of the first stakeholders we sat down with when we started thinking about our approach to AI ethics for Rolls-Royce was our trades unions because the deployment of artificial intelligence in industrial processes could potentially have a direct impact on the experience of, of our employees and indeed on the skills that they need and the future of their employment. So actually talking to our trades unions as a critical stakeholder first up is part of the process of understanding how do we help our employees go on that journey in a way which is supportive and, which, and in, a way, in a way which understands that some of the choices we're making will have an impact potentially on, on, on their lives as just as, as much members of the public as they are employees. That's really interesting. I, I, it, let, let's talk about talent for a second because we spend a lot of time talking about data, but let's talk about people for a second. It, if it's the case that in some kind of critical cutting edge AI projects that, that you or other companies are, are doing, Caroline, it, it, it might be the case that you're having to work with um, data scientists who command kind of large salaries and who can dictate terms and who kind of can come in for six months and then leave again. They might not want to stay for the sort of five or six years. If that's the sort of people you're working with, how do you make sure that Rolls-Royce's AI values are embedded in them and what they do? Um, again, we are lucky here because of the, the safety criticality that's part of the DNA of the organization. So because we have safety boards that also cover digital product development, because we have a very well-established quality assurance structure within the organization, when we bring in new talent, whether we're bringing in um, you know, academic partners, whether we're bringing in new young talent, whether we're bringing in um, you know, experts in residence who might just work with us for a limited period of time to kind of get us some traction on an area that they have particular expertise in, all of those are governed within that, um, that safety criticality mindset and, and, and the, 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 the governance tools and techniques and the frameworks that we use apply regardless of how long you're with us or, or indeed where you come from. What's very interesting is that when we when we when we talk to our development community about those frameworks um they started um uh, you know when we first started introducing them being very concerned that this would constrain them you know mm. this was going to be oh my goodness i'm going to have to comply with things and you know do be part of an audit process and provide evidence and i just uh, i would just like to go and explore um what actually happened was that th the process of asking them to think about the ethical considerations for their deployments up front actually resulted in them having much more uh, creative responses to the challenges that they were looking at. So actually the feedback has been, yes, of course, there is some overhead in making sure that you're able to demonstrate your the evidence base, but, but they are prepared to sacrifice that or that you give that overhead because actually the process broadens their thinking and, and ultimately gives them a, a better developed de uh, development path than, than they would have had otherwise. Okay, that's really interesting. I'm going to bring in Anand uh, on, on this point. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, I agree with uh, what Caroline is saying. So uh, in terms of getting the data scientists to think differently, but now currently e that has to happen with each and every company. Now data scientists by their very nature, by their very training 
are so focused on accuracy, performance of models, not other considerations, other criteria. So we really need to have a very much a fundamental change in the way we educate our data scientists, right? So to start right from whatever uh, bachelor's level, master's level courses on data and analytics or AI, that needs to have the ethical component really at the heart of it, right? So. Otherwise, again, the things are happening, but it'll be much slower, right? So uh, it's it's always also, uh, um, there's a balance in all of these things. When you talk about these principles, uh, sometimes I, I think most people think of it as sort of, hey, it's a principle is more like a law rule that cannot be uh, violated. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all of these things, there are trade-offs, right? So it's not that, transparent is such a virtue that you always need to be transparent. Now, let's just take a simple example, cyber intrusion, right? So you have an algorithm that is detecting cyber intrusion. Now, should we go and be very transparent as to how that algorithm works and, and release it publicly so that everyone else can then come and uh, come and attack us? No, right? So it, it, when, I, when I put it that way, people say, of course, that's not. But you can go down to various levels of transparency. Transparency to whom, uh, why, right? So why do you want to hear it, right? So sometimes it is the heart of the way companies make money. Are we you now saying if you use responsible AI, you shouldn't be making any money, you should be declaring. No, that's not the way we work, right? So I think same way in the talent, I think we need a fundamental re-education uh, of our data scientists uh, to infuse the ethics, right? So that's one aspect of it. Similarly, on the ethical side, right? So there, it's a much more of a soft science, but people there also need to understand how AI machine learning models work so that they can more appropriately guide us from ethical perspective, right? So it's not the same as a software. It is different, right? So in what way is it different? So there needs to be education on both sides. And again, we see that happening in companies. We need to bring in business people who are obviously very, very uh, concerned about the, the metrics and how we drive market share, data scientists concerned about performance, and you have the AI ethics coming in saying, hey, you need to ad address all of these principles, and it becomes more of a confusion, so there really needs to be this trade-off. And I would say uh, data scientists are more scientists as opposed to engineers, don't treat them as engineers and put them into a, a box of, hey, you need to follow all of these and tick all the boxes and check all the crosses here, then they'll just leave, right? So they have that innovative scientific experimentation spirit. So we need to know when do we want to apply our process on these scientists versus when we don't want to, right? So if they're innovating something, don't put in all of the constraints around them. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be thinking about ethics, they should be, but don't put too many process constraints around them. But if you are releasing things to a product, uh, you definitely have to impose some of those so that you're releasing a product. So I think it's it's more nuanced than uh, it, it just getting everyone to do something and follow a process because then that stifles innovation and stifles the data scientists who like to explore. It's really interesting that you mentioned uh, cyber cybersecurity as an area where uh, you might not want to release all the all the underlying uh, data for very good reasons. Let, let's end this discussion by talking about um, a type of business where you might want to release the data, the underlying data, or, or have transparency around the, the algorithmic decision-making process. So say you have been denied by an AI-based system for a bank loan. Mm -hmm. What is the way of squaring the circle there between a complicated and, and, and very technical AI algorithmic process on the one hand and a, a consumer's right to know why a computer has made a decision that could have and would have a very significant effect on their life? Yeah. So uh, there, what I would say, transparency means very different things uh, across different stakeholders. Now, let's just take uh, the end consumer. If I've been approved of a loan, I really don't care what the explanation is. So you can tell me your score was beyond 630, whatever the number, and we got, so I don't care, I got my loan, right? So if I'm denied a loan, again, an explanation which says that 
hey, our cutoff is 630, you just happen to be 625, sorry, uh, doesn't help me at all, right? So mm -hmm. you need to be more specific on an explanation and, and an explanation that will help me maybe gain that loan, maybe gain a lesser amount of the loan because I don't cross a certain threshold, whatever it is, you need an explanation that is uh, uh, more, more uh, uh, actionable by me, right? So now that's, that's the notion of transparency. Now, if I'm a executive or let's say bank manager, I need to be told why I'm making this explanation for this user and not that user. So something that a bank manager or, or whoever providing the loan can understand. Now, if I'm an executive running the division, the risk analytics, so I need something where I'm saying that, A, I'm not discriminating anyone unfairly, right? So again, fairness has 30 definitions. Formal definitions of fairness are 30 plus definitions. So which fairness definition do I choose? That's not easy, right? So that's a discussion. It's not a formula. So someone needs to know which fairness definition we have chosen and why given our corporate view. Now, you need all of these notions of transparency when you go to the regulator and the regulator comes in and says, how do I know you are doing the right thing? And then you say, yeah, here's the algorithm. Here's how we treat, here's how we get the data. Here's what the algorithm is built. Here's the fairness definition. This is how we explain to uh, end consumer. And you lay, need to lay all of that. Yes, transparency to the regulator, but you don't need this full transparency transparency released on your website for everyone to see. Why? Why would you want to do that, right? So again, uh, so it, it, just to the notion of transparency, there's also a notion of secrecy, right? So you're not revealing certain information, right? So, and, and both are necessary. So it's not one or the other, it's the balance. I think if there's anything I would say in all of these things, we just need to balance out for the specific situation. And do you, do you think you can achieve that balance for, for, through a self-regulatory structure? My, my own view is that no, uh, self-regulation, again, each one interprets uh, uh, the, their own guidelines. So I think you do need regulation. That's my personal view. You need regulation more as a guardrail so that you, you can point to the right direction not necessarily to go into every specific use case. I mean, AI is a very much a, a growing discipline, right? So it's anything that has not been done as AI, anything that has been done is no longer called AI. So in that sense, it'll always remain something that, that is sort of forward looking. So in that sense, you don't want to constrain by looking at each and every piece of technology, but say, how are you going to use it? Who are going to be impacted in it? What is the risk of the impact? I and mean, that's, the, that's the line of thought that EU has taken. I think that sort of provides a framework in which I think the other newer technologies can come, right? So again, um, we are just talking about AI while people are talking about blockchain and metaverse and all kinds of things. So many of the uh, risks that we talk about here in AI get manifested or get, get blown, blown up or, or increased in, in some of those technologies as well. Again, if you start expecting the regulators to know every technology that comes in and then start regulating them, uh, that, that's going to be a, a nightmare. So you want to have the right guideline and framework under which uh, some of these technologies can be brought in. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anand. I, I see we're three minutes over, so I, I better wrap up. But just to say thank you to Caroline, to Anand, to, to everyone on the chat who have contributed such interesting and insightful uh, comments and statements, Anushka, uh, Kevin, uh, Mark Etienne, uh, Kate, Basil Towers, Pearl Lee. I mean, the, the list is kind of endless. And, and we, um, you know, we, we, we haven't finished this, this conversation at all. It's an ongoing subject for, for most people on this chat, for us at Tortoise. Hopefully we can continue some of this debate tonight uh, over dinner. Uh, but if I take one thing away from it, it's this kind of interesting interrelationship between three uh, principles that are separate but connected, transparency, accountability, and uh, this one I like particularly, explainability. Uh, much more to discuss, but in the meantime, I hope everyone on the call has a, a very lovely day and to see you all very soon. Take care. Bye.